G'day, I'm Clive and welcome back at the Armadale Reptile Centre and we're back with Lucy. So today we're going to be talking about the Dugite. The Dugite? Yes. Okay, so we the are. biggest one first. We are. We're going to start with the most common, probably the most common people come across. Yep. Yes. So the Dugite then, let's say with the size, how big would they get up to? So on average, 1.5 metres is a pretty good size. Um, they can get to two meters. Two meters and above is rare. I think I've seen one individual that's been over two meters. But um, generally, just like everything else, the bigger it is, the more mature it is. So um, a lot of people probably don't come across the much bigger individuals because they've been in this world a long time. They know where safe, where's not safe. But 1.5 is a very average, average size. Yeah, so the actual video of the do guide we got today. He's about two meters or just yeah, over two meters yeah, he looked. Yeah. yeah, that's Brutus and he's one of our biggest individuals and it's very rare to see one his size. So roughly how old is Brutus? He is a rescue, so I don't know for a fact how old he is, but we know he's fully mature, so we would place him probably about 10 years older. And so, um, that's a pretty good age for him. So is that the average age or? No, no, they can get quite a bit older. Um, and they can live, live for almost up to 20 years. Um, in captivity, they'll naturally live a lot longer than in the wild. Um, but you'll find that heavy predation happens for young individuals. And then once they get to a good decent size, so probably over about a metre, the number of predators that can get to them are reduced quite a lot. Um, but to make it to a good, good sized adult is um, an incredible achievement nowadays so yeah so going from the, the small babies yes are they eggs or are they born live so they are eggs um so they do lay a clutch of eggs um, and the mother will incubate and protect the eggs once the eggs hatch however that's the end of her commitment she doesn't doesn't really care about them after that she'll go one way they'll go and scatter the other way um, so there is a bit of a misconception that mothers will hang around and protect their young. Um, mother does not care. <laughs> she's done her bit, she's done her nine yards and she's out of there, um, ready to move on and do it again somewhere else. How, how, how large is the clutch of eggs? Um, well, it does vary a great deal. So they can only have a few or they can have up to about 15 eggs. Um, and then it is highly variable on how many of them are even um, viable eggs as well. So it's potential for a few of them to become what's known as slugs. So it's eggs that just haven't gotten to the end of their lifespan. Whether they were ever fertilized at the beginning or not is debatable. Um, and then, uh, so you may have, say she's laid 15 eggs, but only six individuals actually emerge and survive um, to move on. So it's a life, um, life history that they have where they have many many young because the predation on their young is very high so having lots of babies mean that some babies will survive um, and they don't have any parental care so the babies just have to fully develop when they're born and fend for themselves entirely on their own yeah. so the, the, the babies I think we mentioned in one of the other videos but about the how venomous these babies are because mm. there's a misconception at times isn't there there is that um, babies are more venomous than adults um, and it's just a sheer fact on biological size a baby typically can be born at about 30 centimeters um, and that's very very small as opposed to a 1.5 meter adult um, they are fully developed but the size of their fangs, the size of their venom sacs um, are very, very, very small. Not to say they can't cause damage or injury to people, but the chances of it are significantly lower. Um, and as you can imagine, an animal that's only 30 centimetres long has so, so many more predators than an animal that's 1.5 to 2 metres long. So they are a lot more scared, um, but like all, all animals, the, they don't want to fight they want to fly, they want to hide, they want to get away from everything. So they will, if you give them the chance, um, get away from it all. So the, the, the adults as well, they, is it right that they, they, they prefer not to fight, but rather than back off, yeah. give you a warning and try yeah. and get out there? They won't, they, sometimes they won't even give you a warning. They'll just look at you and be like, you're getting a little bit too close. You keep advancing towards them and then, yeah, they might do the traditional kind of bend back and the S that people are very, um, familiar with 
Um, and then you'd have to push it even further. And then that's when they'd probably try and bite. Typically that's a closed mouth bite. So they're not actually got their mouth open. It's just a kind of like a smack against you. It's like a warning. To yeah. Back and off. then push it even further. And then, well, now you're getting into the dangerous um, territory. But for them, if they bite a predator to them and envenomate it, they now have to go through a process of re um, making all that venom within their body before they can eat again. So they're unable to eat for a period of time if they uh, bite a predator. So they don't want to do it. It just makes their life harder. So they'll give every warning in the book before they give the final warning. So if you, you do approach one and you find one there and they're yep. local to you, yeah. what is the best thing for a person to do? So typically um, it's said that a snake can strike to half of its body length. So you got a two meter, two meter dugite, he'll probably be able to strike within one meter. So the recommended advice is if you are beyond that strike zone, um, you are pretty safe to slowly move and walk away from it. Um, if you're within that strike zone, it's recommended that, I know it goes against every instinct, but you just remain still. Um, if you remain still, you look like a tree. Um, a tree's not dangerous, a tree's not gonna harm them, and they just go, okay, well, this is boring, I'm just gonna move over here now. So that's the recommended advice. Um, so, is to do that. so that'd be slowly and gently? Very slowly and gently, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, some people move slow and then go, yeah, the last yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, um, they do react quite heavily to movement, so, uh, if you think about it, when they're going around looking for something to eat, it's those quick, sharp, darting movements that makes them aware that there's prey around. So naturally, they're um, inclined to investigate or look at quick, sharp movements. So if you're walking along and, and you start waving your arms or jumping up and down at him, he's going to get intimidated by it. Um, and uh, then suddenly you might find that he's a bit angry with you and you can't just walk away from him. So it's always best to keep it nice and calm, nice and slow, nice and chilled out. If you're chilled out, he's chilled out. So where's the most likely spots you'd have a female lay her eggs? Anywhere where it's... So they need two, two things are the best places for them. They need somewhere where there's going to be food for when their young are born and then for the mother as well. Because once she has laid her eggs, um, and she's incubated them, she's going to want to feed. That's the first thing that she's going to want to do. So she's going to try and pick a spot where food is relatively abundant, but then also they want somewhere where it is sheltered, where they don't, aren't going to get disturbed, um, they aren't going to get dug up, they aren't going to get um, you know, moved or anything like that. So places like you might find them in your horse stables, you might find them in your chook pens, you might find them near bird aviaries, but by far the biggest thing is uh, refuse and litter around people's properties. So building materials are probably one of the most common things that you find them um, under, um, particularly like tin sheets and things like that, because they warm up. So they stay nice and warm, nice and dark, and they can hide under there. Um, they generally don't move for months at a time when people have these in their gardens. So, um, but even things like uh, under houses, um, if you've got the houses on stilts, or you've got gaps under your house, you might find them under there, um, in and around sheds, um, places like that. So anywhere that is gonna be a dark, warm, probably with lots of food around place. Um, so it, in other words, you've got lots of mice around. Yes, yes. There's a high chance they're gonna be laying yeah, eggs Yeah, yeah, even, even things like tree stumps and, and um, trees that have fallen over and, and things like that. So it needs to be relatively sheltered. And there's something about the, uh, the concrete slabs where the backyard you know, yes. getting the wash. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they could, honestly, they could be anywhere. And not, not just the mothers and eggs, but even just adults chilling out for the day on their way to find a different meal or anything like that. So you can find them all over the joint. And they do like to see most commonly removed snake. In the, in the Perth metro the Perth area, metro, yes, yes, definitely. Um, because of urbanisation, they've been one of the few animals that have probably um, benefited from it. Because with coming with us comes all the rodents, the rats, the mice, the shelter, all yes. those sorts of things. So they have been able to adopt into our lifestyle very easily. 
um, and they've probably benefited from it. So that's why you will find them more commonly um, around here. So it's common to see them around the sun dunes and Yeah, yeah, beaches. you do have them along the, the beaches. They're very, very, very widespread. They have a very good um, ability to go into multiple different sort of, um, particularly like ground um, types, so sand, clay, um, even to a small degree, they might go into swampy areas or marshy areas, forested areas. So they're very adaptive to those sorts of things, but they are restricted to the south, the southwest. So they do need that more of a cooler climate than some of the other elaphid species we have. So hence, yeah. if you walk in the Bimbledon track, like I did, I saw my first snake actually on the Bibbulmun track just outside of Donnelly River. That was a dugite. So keep your eyes open. And it's normally on the sunny part of the track where they're warming themselves back up again. That's right? Yep. Yeah. And did you just walk on straight past him or did he move on oh, himself? I, I tapped my walking poles yeah. and looked at me, turned around and went off. And straight off. Yep. That's so it. That's, that's all you need to do. Don't panic. Just give your poles a tap and wait and they will move yeah they definitely will so they're, they're basically down in the southwest but what's the rough area people may get to see them well <clears throat> you'd have to go out of the city into a bit more of the rurally sort of areas um as far as i understand i've never known anyone to catch any above sort of the chittering chidlo area um i've never known them to be north of there um, but they will go all the way down to the south coast. Along around the Esperance area? Yeah, and yeah. they'll yeah, go over a little bit towards the east. Um, and I think towards the border is basically about it with South Australia. I don't believe they go anywhere into South Australia. Um, but yeah, you will have to go further out to see proper wild ones um, and not ones that have just gotten very used to <laughs> being around people. And I think, I can't remember which one I was, I was reading about, but can a do uh, do like actually found on places like Rottnest and they can be yeah. yeah. As far as I understand, I only am aware of one subspecies. That's an island subspecies. Um, tiger snakes is another one that have a few island variants. Um, but it's very possible that they are on on the islands. And there's a uh, there's a couple of islands off uh, the Esperance area. Yeah, yeah. Found out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they they would probably be quite different to our mainland ones in various ways. So sizing, they'd likely be smaller. Um, they'd likely be different colouring, like um, the average colouring would likely be very different um, depending on the climate they're, they're in um, and then the diet that they have. So that can have a great deal of impact on, on how uh, they I, look. I was just about to ask about the diet because that's, that's uh, mainly, we've mentioned mice. Yes. We've got frogs as well, uh, other lizards. Uh, they're Predominantly mammal marsupial eaters, yeah. so they they are fully terrestrial animals, so they are on the ground entirely their life. Um, and mammals marsupials are the main diet, but they have been known to go for re other reptiles. Um, bobtails is a big one that people have captured them uh, having a snack on um, quite a lot. King skinks as well, particularly when you get to like the juni areas. Um, but mammals, marsupials are the top, um, but they are a bit of garbage guts. They and it's coming back to the misconception when people say if you see a bobtail, there'll be no snakes. Oh yes. Yeah. A lot of people think that's because snakes are afraid of the bobtail, but it's the opposite. Yes. The actual bobtails in an area that they feel safe that there's no snakes. Yeah, more so, than likely, yeah. Yes. So don't take that interpretation. If it's a bobtail, there's no snakes because it possibly is, no. but just not in that direct vicinity. But maybe 10, 15, 20 metres away they can be. Yes, very true. Anything else you think people need to know that's important? Well, um, dugites are a difficult one to ID for a lot of people. Their colour morphs are incredibly varied. It is probably the most varied animal that we have um, over here. They can range from very pale colouring to very, very dark colouring and every type of shade of browns and, and whites and creams and yellows in between. Um, they can have olive colouring to them. They can not have olive, olive colouring. 
Um, and then on top of that, they could have spotting. So a lot of them will have black uh, spotting along their body, whether that's quite a bit or not a lot. They could be quite striped with their spotting. They could be quite zigzaggy with their spotting. Um, the variation is so extreme that identification can be difficult um, for people. Um, the main way we can identify a dew guide if we're not 100% certain that the, co the colour variation is very extreme is location. Um, it's very unlikely that there's any other sort of a leopard in an area that a dew guide is in um, other than the tiger snake. Um, so it is, but typically the main colouring type you'll have is this olivey grey sort of colouring um, and they do have these black um, speckly spotty um, to them um, and that could be a few typically more up towards the top of the body but it could extend all the way down it could have um, and zigzags as well yeah, and they, on top they had them they got just a slightly larger black area area instead they, of just spots so they've got a few gathered they can do yeah, yeah they can do but um, at the end of the day there's no rule as to how to identify a dew guy on on its colour morph alone um, and there should never be a rule because you'll get make so many mistakes otherwise um, and then that's the that's led to a bit of a sad situation um, because of their high variety um, and the ability to misidentify them very easily there's lots and lots of very small um, snake species that get incorrectly ID'd as dew guides um, and then unfortunately are dispatched because of that fear of the dugite um, and so it has led to a bit of bit of issue in that way so it's very important that we learn to identify what is dangerous and what isn't but then also on top of that even more importantly we identify how to deal with it without disturbing it is also an incredibly important process oh. That was a lot of information. Thank you for that. You're very yeah. welcome. <laughs> uh, we'll be back with another video with Lucy. We've got quite a few actually we've got lined up. So keep an eye out for them. And I hope you've enjoyed the video. And if you're not a subscriber, remember go down below, click on the subscribe button, click on the like button as well. And I almost forgot, next to the subscribe button there's a bell button. Click on that and select all. So you can be notified of all future videos and if you are already a subscriber again i thank you very much